let us start. I mean, the topic is 360 degree management of heart failure. So this is the hospital where I work in. This is a 350 bedded multi-specialty hospital with, uh, with more than 120 hospitals all across the globe. And uh, this has been recently has been coming in uh, the, the heart of Navi Mumbai. So let's go to the topic properly. So we'll start with a question. I mean, I have a lady who is a 67 year old female and has got a new onset or recent onset breathlessness, dyspnea. She has got night uh, uh, cough, uh, tiredness. She's a diabetic, hypertensive, and, and also there is a ex-smoker. There's a history of treatment for bronchial asthma. Now this lady or male is presented to us in uh, for, for management. I mean, uh, how you will go ahead? I mean, let's go to the examination proper. Blood pressure is borderline 100 by 76. The pulse rate, she has got a tachycardia, which is with the heart rate around 120 per minute. The saturation set room air is a little bit on the lower side, which is 92. There's a pedal edema. The chest on auscultation showed bilateral crepes, basal fine crepes. And in cardiovascular system, there is a faint pan-systolic murmur at the apex, and there's an S3 and S4. Now, the question is, uh, the uh, how do these people present with? I mean, uh, the patients of uh, heart failure, uh, they can present to you like a left-sided heart failure, or they can present to you with a right-sided heart failure. The patient who come with a left-side heart failure usually are very much distressed. They can be restless, there can be a confusion, the patient will have an orthopnea, their heart rate will be high, there will be history of very recent onset, increased intensity of exertional dyspnea, there will be fatigue, you can see some cyanosis. On an examination, you will find that they will have thready pulse, there can be no bilateral wheezes, fine crepes, respiratory rate may be high, on the other hand, the patient can have right-sided heart failure where the patient may be comfortable, but there can be enormous amount of uh, swelling all over the body. There can be ascites. The jugular venous pressure will be distended. There is pain can be palpable. And the abdominal will be distant, distension. There's a history of uh, weight gain and uh, complaints related to abdomen like uh, decreased appetite, GI distress may be there. So, the presentation of heart failure is also depends upon which side of the heart is involved, is the right side or the left side of the heart is involved. So when we talk about the breathlessness, there are multiple terms which has been used in breathlessness and they are very specific to differentiate them from the, from the pulmonary causes of breathlessness. See, breathing difficulty or dyspnea is a, is, a, is a term which is not very specific for a particular system to be involved. But when we talk about orthopnea, tripopnea, bendopnea or paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea, these are the terms which are related to dyspnea, which are very particular to, to cardiology. Cardiac functions are to very precise to the heart failure. So <clears throat> what is the orthopnea means? I mean, respiratory distress on lying down position, what is the mechanism for that? So when the patient lies down flat on the bed, the patient develops breathlessness. So what is the reason for that? And when the patient sits up, the breathlessness improves. The reason is the venous return and the cardiac outputs are increased by 25% on lying down position. There's a reabsorption of edema fluid from the lower limbs into circulation. And also the viscera pushes the diaphragm up and then encroaches on the lung, along the lungs. These are the reasons why the patient of uh, heart failure will have an orthopnea. So if somebody tells you that he has got a breathlessness and the patient also associates orthopnea along with the breathlessness, please keep it in mind. We are talking about, we are dealing with probably a case of heart failure, because this is a classical symptom of, of heart failure. Second thing is the paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea. I mean, this, in this case, the patient goes to sleep, sleep for two, three hours comfortably, then gets up in the night, probably two o'clock, three o'clock, midnight, and, and then the patient complains of breathlessness. So the mechanism here is also almost the same uh, as, a, as, an, as, an, as an orthopnea, but along with that, what happens in is in this uh, is there's a there's an also associated blunting of respiratory and cough centers response during sleep and that allows the pulmonary congestion to accumulate that is why the two three hours which he gets to sleep there's a time when the blunting of respiratory and cough center happens and also sometimes it is associated with the bad dreams which cause increase in heart rate and BP so that can also potentiate the breathlessness which happens deep into the night 
So tripopnea is usually seen in lung disorder, where the patient may have a, a one side pure diffusion. If he lies down on the other side, patient develops, you know, feels better. That means the, the side in which there is an aerated lungs, if he lies down, the circulation is better on that side and patient may develop, um, feels better and breathlessness. So this can also happen in patients of heart failure if they have a right side heart failure, which very often happens in patients with a, a frank heart failure. So this is something about the, the bendopnea. Bendopnea means patient will develop breathlessness on lying on bending forward. I mean, we know in our in our multiple religions when we pray, we, we bend forward. Now the bending that forwards can cause breathlessness. So, so the patient can come to you and say that, sir, whenever I bend down, I feel breathlessness. So that is what classical classical happens. And this is um, this this happens because there's increased ventricular filling pressures during bending which exacerbates an already high filling pressures in the patients with heart failure. It is also associated with worse cardiac index, pulmonary capillary vest pressures, right heart pressures, and pulmonary heart pressures. So mendopnea also can, in history, can give you an, again, can give you an idea that this patient is suffering from probably a heart failure. So uh, coming on to the investigations proper, this patient has a CBC, um, hemoglobin was 10.1. And in peripheral smear, it was reported as microcytic hypochromic anemia. Uh, then the creatinine was 1.3. So for the age, the GFR is on the lower side. The potassium was 4.6. Now these things are important because when we write medicines, when we treat these patients, we need to be careful about the electrolytes, creatinines, current status and all. So what all investigations are important? I mean, the most important investigation, if, if you wanted to calibrate the treatment, especially in a patient who has got a associated bronchial asthma is to find out the anti-proBNP. I mean, the breathlessness can be because of exaggeration of bronchial asthma, or it can be because of precipitation of acute heart failure. It's important to know the difference. In, and the, the test which, which usually does the differentiation is anti-proBNP. So a normal level of anti-proBNP is considered as less than 125 in a patients with zero to 74 years, and less than 450 in patients with 75 to 99 years. But to, to, to tell a uh, tell little more accurate, if the patient has got anti more than 450 uh, up to the age of 50 years and more than 900 up to the age of um, uh, above 50 years, that is what we can, can say com uh, comfortably that the patient also has a heart failure. So anti BNP is an hormone which is released from the, the atria when they are stressed. So the stretching of these chambers produces this anti BNP. And rise in anti BNP is important marker of heart failure. Now, if you have an emergency patient who is complaining of breathlessness and you don't find any signs of heart failure in clinical examination, you can do this test and you can differentiate patient of heart failure from bronchial asthma. Also, there's a possibility that patient can have an overlap syndrome, overlap symptoms like this patient can have an underlying baseline on the bronchial asthma. On top of that, the patient has developed heart failure. So you can simultaneously treat both heart failure as well as asthma. So that is the importance of this test. Also, this test helps us in following up of the patient, prognostication of the patient. If the anti BNP is in the range of 14,000, 15,000, then the prognosis of these patients are not great. But if the anti BNP reduces drastically with your treatment, that means your treatment is on the right line. It also suggests the effectiveness of your treatment. Suppose you have started a treatment, for example, if you started army or you started any specific drug for heart failure and you see the patient after 15 days and you find that the anti BNP is nicely reduced, you know that the treatment is fine, you are going on the right way and patient is improving. So anti BNP for diagnosis, prognosis, as well as effectiveness of treatment, it's a very good test to be done in patients of heart failure. ECG can have various spectrum. You can have an almost normal looking ECG to a most weird of ECGs. But in a patient with severe, severe LV dysfunction, patient can have wide QRS, you can have left ventricle enlargement, left ventricle hypertrophy, intraventricular conduction defect, or RV progression can have an atrial fibrillation, old interval MI. So all these things can help us you not only in diagnosing the heart failure, but also in, in finding out the cause. For example, a poorly Poor RV progression, old interval MI can help you in diagnosing if you have old interval MI, probably ischemic cardiomyopathy, ischemia, and the death of tissues in the heart has led to the heart failure. So ECG is an important tool. Now, this X-ray is a normal appearing X-ray of a patient. You can see the normal distribution, the bony cages, the soft tissue, 
the, the bronchovascular marking appears normal. You can see that the, 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 there is no syphilization, there is no Curly's B9, there is no pneumonia, the cardiomegaly, the cardiac uh, structure appears to be normal. There's no right atrial enlargement, no left atrial enlargement. But if you see this X-ray, this is classical of a patient who has got heart failure. If you see the, the increased cardiothoracic ratio, suggestive of cardiomegaly, you can see this interstitial edema, you can see so Curly's B, B line, you can see the cephalization of vessels, you can see the, 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 and the lob, lobular pleural effusion giving rise to the white line suggestive of interstitial pleural, pleural effusion. So all those things can happen. So to, to remember it easily, is you can use something like an ABCD. A is for alveolar edema, that is bad wig appearance. P is the Curly's B line, that is interstitial edema. C is for cardiomegaly. D is for pleural effusion, and uh, sorry, D is for uh, dilated prominent upper upper lobe vessels. We call it as a cephalization of blood vessels in the lung. So D is the dilated prominent upper lobe vessels, and E is for pleural effusion. So A, B, C, D, E of heart failure X-ray is very well defined, and you can compare it. Any patient you get an X-ray, you can see that you can see that features. You may not get all the features, but yes, we should look into this. Oh!